today's video takes a look at how scientists have used the biology that we've been studying to help solve one of the world's biggest problems, hunger. The topic is modifying DNA through breeding or GMO, and we're going to approach this topic by thinking about food with the essential question, what is the best way to get better crops and animals? One reason we need better crops and animals is because of world hunger. It's estimated that 1.2 billion people worldwide don't get enough nutritious food every day. And this means about one in seven people. If we can figure out how to grow more food or more nutritious food, then the problem of world hunger can be fixed or at least helped. So that's how we can frame this problem. To solve world hunger, scientists need to increase the nutritional value of food or increase the yield of crops to produce more food, or both. So with those goals in mind, people have tried some different approaches in agriculture. The first agricultural approach I want to talk about is the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was an approach that exploded in the 1950s with the goal of increasing yields by using a lot of machinery to increase efficiency, fertilizers to make plants grow faster and bigger, and pesticides to decrease the organisms that would eat the crops before harvesting. And the Green Revolution actually did accomplish its goal. You can see that world grain production rose from about 900 million metric tons in 1961 all the way to about uh, 2,200 million metric tons in about 50 years. And that's a two and a half times increase. And here's some even more updated data. That's the cool thing. So even though crop yields rose about three times, the amount of land used to grow these crops stayed pretty flat, stayed the same. So what this means is that the Green Revolution had the benefits of getting three times more crops without having to use more farmland. But we know that there's no decision that comes with benefits and no trade-offs. The trade-offs to the Green Revolution are that Chemicals and machines needed for this process are very expensive. And when farmers use too much of those chemicals, the chemicals can pollute the environment. So are those trade-offs worth it to get the benefits of higher yields using the same amount of lands? Or are there other solutions? Another way that scientists and farmers have worked together is to try to make the actual organisms better by changing the organism's DNA. One way to do this is a way that we've studied, selective breeding. Remember, selective breeding is when humans select the best organisms with the best traits and use those organisms as breeders to make the next generation. And we saw this in class with our dog selective breeding example. One of the earliest known examples of selective breeding involves corn. Farmers have been selectively breeding corn for about 10,000 years. Originally, corn was a wild grass called teosinti. Mexican farmers selected the plants with the largest and best tasting kernels and bred those together to make better crops. And that happened over thousands of years. And now we have this. But you can see how corn has evolved along the way due to selective breeding. Sure, it took 10,000 years to get here, but hey, now we've got big ears of corn that can feed more people. So selective breeding clearly results in better plants, making better crops by changing the DNA over time, increasing the crop yields, making the, the crops better. The bad part is though, that it takes a really long time. Do you think the 1.2 billion hungry people want to wait 10,000 years for a solution? Probably not. Another quicker solution to the problem of world hunger lies in GMOs. GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism. What this is, is when scientists cut out a gene from the DNA of one organism and paste that gene into the DNA of an organism they want to improve. And an example of this is the GMO apple called an Arctic apple. Normally, apples turn brown within minutes or 
couple of hours of being cut. But scientists have put a gene into Arctic apples so that these apples don't turn brown. Which one would you want to eat if it was sitting around for a little while? You'd probably pick the Arctic apple based on looks alone. Making genetically modified organisms has been around for nearly 50 years. Scientists made genetically modified bacteria in 1973, but then put the science to good use by modifying the bacteria to produce human insulin in 1982. Now, almost all insulin used by diabetics is made by GMO bacteria. Since then, GMO foods have been made like arctic apples and a tomato with a fish gene that resists bruising. Finally, scientists have even made glowfish, a GMO pet that you can buy in most pet stores. A huge benefit of GMOs is that scientists can give organisms traits that there's no way would get there on their own. No matter how much selective breeding you do, you'd never get a fish that glows. And GMO technology gives results fast. While selective breeding can take hundreds or thousands of years, GMO organisms can be made in just a few years. But the main trade-off for GMOs is that because they're so new, people are pretty afraid. Since GMO foods have only been around for like 25 years, there's no way that people can fully understand the effects of GMOs on people that eat them or animals or the environment. And there hasn't been any solid evidence so far that says GMOs are harmful. But with only 25 years to look at this problem, scientists don't know the complete picture. And people can get freaked out about that. And now I want to talk about the actual science behind making a GMO, putting our recent studies to use. Well, it's like a three-step process to make a GMO. Step one is to identify a desirable trait in an organism. So, for example, jellyfish can glow. That's pretty cool. Step two is to cut out the gene for the trait. Now, scientists know exactly where the glow gene is in jellyfish, and they can cut that gene out of jellyfish DNA. Step three is to paste the gene into the DNA of the other organism. So once scientists had the jellyfish glow gene, they could just paste it into the DNA of a fish. Since DNA uses the same four bases, A, T, C, and G, in every single organism, you can put DNA from one organism into another, and the DNA can still work. Let's look at another real example. The sustainability problem farmers saw was that strawberries are temperature sensitive. After the strawberry plants start to grow, if the weather gets too cold overnight or for a couple of days, the plants will die and the whole strawberry crop will be destroyed. Other scientists studying fish found that flounder fish, a weird looking fish that looks like this, that live in freezing cold waters actually have a gene in their DNA that helps them resist freezing, even when the water freezes. So what if scientists could put this antifreeze gene into strawberries? Well, after identifying the gene, scientists isolated the gene. So in other words, they got DNA from the flounder fish and cut out just the antifreeze gene from the DNA. And they'd actually use DNA isolation techniques that are kind of like the ones that we saw in class to get DNA from cheek cells. Next, the scientists have to paste the fish antifreeze gene into strawberry DNA. And scientists do this by cutting and pasting using enzymes and try to target strawberry seeds so that all the cells in the new plant will have the new fish gene. The end result of this process is antifreeze strawberries, which actually were made in 2004. Antifreeze strawberries do solve the problem of strawberry plants freezing in cold weather, but you can't buy them at the store. That's not because the strawberries have been proven to be unsafe, but that people are totally weirded out by the idea of having a piece of fish DNA in their strawberries. What do you think? Would you eat these strawberries? Is solving this sustainability problem worth overcoming any fears?